Okay, so when we talk about you know the Eucharist, I think it's important to maybe maybe look back to the time of in the first few centuries, maybe what some of the first Christians thought, maybe starting with Paul, but then of course the apostolic and church fathers beyond them. Because there's sometimes the claim, or the, maybe this is a question, I guess a question isn't really an argument, but the question, I'll pose it to you. Um, wasn't the doctrine of transubstantiation invented in the whatever 13th century oh, at well, the Sean, first I'll actually Council? say yes, it was invented. The word transubstantiation was invented. But you want to know what? So was the word purgatory and Christmas and Trinity because and Easter because none of those words are in the Bible. It's one of the things that like we need to come up with words to explain the theology okay. that is in our Bible. So the word bi- the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. The word purgatory isn't in the Bible. The word Christmas isn't in the Bible. The word mm. Easter isn't in the Bible. None of them are in the Bible. Mm. So we have to create language. So the word transubstantiation, it's not in the Bible. Yeah. And Thomas Aquinas is the one who coined the term okay. in the mid-1200s. Yeah. So some people will say, oh, the Catholic Church made up this stuff. No, we came to a way to explain it better, to right. be able to proclaim what theologically is in the text that we've always believed. It's just like a man and a woman, they love each other. And yet the deeper that they love each other, the more that they're able to actually define that love. If you ask a, you know, a teenage boy and a teenage girl who will eventually get married and have five children, like to explain the depths of their love when they're, you know, 17 and 18, they can't. When you ask them when they're, when they're 60 and 70 to express what their love is, mm they're able to put it into beautiful terms. And they might even come up with like words to describe things they, they, they can't even imagine sure. that were going to happen in their life. And so the same is true like in the church, uh, through time and experience, the church begins to express who she is and uh, in deeper terms. And so, yeah, like the word Trinity, like... It was invented at the, count, at the Council of Nicaea. The Council, the, the word Christmas. If you're going to say that transubstantiation yeah. was invented, yeah. you could say the same thing about the basic fundamental that yeah. doctrines of Christianity. It's insanity. Sorry. But they weren't the but the doctrine them, themselves weren't invented. No, like the, just the, the terminology. The Trinity has always existed. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now right. and ever shall be world without end. Amen. As a Christian, we have to believe in, in our basic sense that that the Trinity has always existed. So where could we look, I guess, to 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 see that even like St. Paul would have understood that this is what Jesus meant, even if he didn't have the word transubstantiation, he would have believed in real presence. And, and yeah, and so that's why I mean we read clearly, you know, in in, in Corinthians about you know Saint Paul talking about you know eating and drinking unworthily. Mm-hmm. Like if if this is just bread or just wine, then why why is Paul telling individuals not to receive yeah. the body and blood of Jesus, and that in doing so they actually bring condemnation upon themselves? Right. So if I'm just eating a like a cracker. And a drink, how am I condemning myself hmm. unless there's a belief already uh, that what Paul is celebrating, and I always like to like I always like to emphasize this, that when Paul celebrates mass, which is what Paul is doing, mm-hmm. which is what all the apostles did, when Paul was celebrating mass and through the grace of transubstantiation, bread and wine it substantially become the flesh and blood of Jesus, he doesn't want people to receive them that shouldn't be receiving them. Hmm. And, and so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that's what we're talking about. And so he says, anyone who drinks of this bread and, and or eats the bread and drinks the cup without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself, um, that they'll be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord for somebody who does that, which is, again, looking to the Old Testament, that means that they're guilty of murder, homicide, essentially. Mortal sin. So that doesn't sound like, so what you're saying is like, it seems clear from Paul's language at the very least that he doesn't take this as a symbol because if it's a symbol, it's, it wouldn't be that kind of severity of language. Correct. Okay. How about, how about beyond, so how about beyond Paul? Like in the first few centuries, like, is there any indication to believe that, that some of these apostolic fathers, these church fathers, that they themselves would have understood a real presence in the Eucharist? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so 
St. Ignatius of, of Antioch, Justin Martyr, mm. uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, some of the earliest church fathers clearly have an understanding of theology that what they are celebrating mm. is, which is the Mass, is not just bread and wine. It's not just a communal meal. It's not just a memorial. It's something much more. Yeah, and so I would love to, I want to read a couple of these here, just because I don't think that that many people have ever read this. I, I and, agree, and actually I just want to like yeah, give, so for anybody who's watching or listening right now, like you have got, the church fathers are unbelievable. Yeah. Like, in no offense, like the God's word is living and true, and you need to read your Bible every single day. I'm a big BB, BB. Bible before breakfast. before breakfast, Bible before bed, like read your Bible, know your Bible, study your Bible. But there's a reason why uh, bishops of the early church and deacons of the early church were writing letters to congregations hmm. because they needed the guidance and the interpretation and the help of the successors of the apostles to understand and to interpret the texts appropriately and well. That's why, so that's why some of these things are so interesting to me. Like, for this isn't what I'm going to read, but for example, as you were saying that, I thought of like St. Clement, who is writing to the Corinthian church in the f- maybe even the first century from Rome, a thousand miles away from Corinth, while John the Apostle is still alive. And he's writing because the, the, the church in Corinth asked him in Rome for his, his advice on how to solve their issue while the Apostle John is still alive, and he's closer. And so already we see this, this church, this governing body that does exist. And maybe that's an episode, that's a different episode in and of itself. But on the Eucharist, yeah, so St. Ignatius of Antioch, who is um, learned from John the Apostle as a boy, and we have in his writings him talking about sitting yep. at the feet of John the Apostle. So this is what he says about the Eucharist. He says, "...take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ." which has come to us, and see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. He says that they abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins, and which that Father in his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. Uh, And that's about 110 A.D., um, extremely early on. Again, he's learning from the guy who wrote John chapter 6. And what I think is interesting, and I always like in Mel Gibson's the, the movie The Passion of the Christ depicts this beautifully. So out of the 12 apostles, who is the only one who is at the cross? Hmm. John. John. Who is the first of the 12 apostles? So he would have heard in the upper room, this is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And what does he now see on the cross? This is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And Gibson shows it like clearly in the movie. Hmm. John, the beloved disciple, clearly has a Eucharistic theology that's like really, really bold yeah. in, in his gospel. I think in my mind, because he got it as he's up there on Calvary. He's seeing my body. He's seeing my blood mm-hmm. being poured out. I mean, even if you listen to like what Ignatius said, his disciple, what does right. he say? They do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our mm-hmm. Savior, Jesus Christ, Flesh, flesh, which suffered for our sins. Hmm. What did John see on Calvary? Flesh that suffered for our sins. Right. That's. I think that's amazing. To me, that couldn't be more clear. As I read that, and again, this is an example, an early example of sacred tradition. That yes. which is that which is handed on, um, both in writing, but also orally, and f- and honestly, first and foremost in in this oral way, in this, in this liturgical way. Yeah. That's why, again, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, I receive from the Lord what I also hand on to you. Uh, and then he goes and says the words of institution as yeah. he's talking about the Eucharist. Okay, somebody else here, Justin Martyr. Uh, this is, he's writing this in about the year 155 A.D. Um, he's also probably the earliest account of the Mass that we have, and I know they include that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, yep. and all the different rites of the Church basically follow the format that he essentially gives um, in, in one of his letters. So in this letter on the Eucharist, he says, This food we call the Eucharist, we do not receive these as common bread and drink, 
For Jesus Christ, our Savior, made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. Likewise, we have been taught that the food blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our own blood and flesh are nourished and changed, is the flesh and blood of Jesus, who was made flesh. Again, there's just another instance of he is taking what he received, what's been handed on to him, you know, as a way of understanding what, you know, Paul would have written and what John would have written. Exactly. And this is the way in which they're understanding things like Luke 22. This is my body. And John 6. You know, This is you not common flesh, bread and blood. drink. Right. It is the flesh and blood of Jesus who was made flesh. And the, the third the person I want to share, and this is really just because, this, so this is a, a few centuries later, but you could note that the, the uh, canon of, New, of the New Testament, the 27 books, had never been formalized together even at this point in the year 350. That wasn't until the first time, 382, at the Synod of Rome. And so this is St. Cyril of Jerusalem. I included this because this is kind of some of this developing of understanding of substance versus accidents, as mm, we were talking about very before. Very good, very good, yes. And so St. Cyril is saying, he's expounding upon, of course, what Paul said and John said and Ignatius and Justin Martyr. And he says about the Eucharist, what seems to be bread is not bread, though it tastes like bread, but the body of Christ. And what seems to be wine is not wine, though it tastes like wine, but the blood of Christ. Again, that's in the year 350 A.D. So he doesn't use the word transubstantiation, but as you as you said, that theology was was just developing so a better yeah, understanding. So when we of talk it. about what seems to be, meaning looks like bread, smells like bread, tastes mm-hmm. like bread, breaks like bread, sounds like bread when it's being broken, but it's not bread. Yes. Yes, and so they know. So the Christians from the time, it's handed on immediately. They know Jesus is present in the Eucharist, but the understanding of exactly how he's, he's really present uh, grows over time and develops and yep. just takes on a more clear understanding. Can I also just like throw into this lot here, and they're not, they're not we, we don't have their names mentioned here yeah. clearly, but if you look at the, the list of Christian martyrs that individuals who died for their faith. And we're talking about young people who died for the faith, particularly young girls. So if you look at the list of Christian martyrs, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, Perpetua, Felicity, this whole list of virgin martyrs, these are young girls who married Jesus at a young age and were willing to die torturous deaths. You can look them all up on you know, find a saint book or Google them or look them up. They believe that they had married Jesus and they refused to either be given away in marriage or to uh, allow them to be sexually impure. At the heart of every single one of them is the fact that they they had a spiritual but also a sacramental encounter with Jesus. Like, they believe that their reception of Holy Communion was a wedding feast. They believed that they had taken the flesh of their of their of their Lord, of their groom into themselves. Like convents hadn't been established, religious life hadn't been established, but these girls, every single one of them, saw themselves as a bride of Jesus. If you read the writings, if you read the accounts, they were married. And that's what the Eucharist is. Hmm. Like it's the eternal wedding feast. It's the banquet of the lamb. Like that's what it is. Right. We take we as the church, the spouse of Christ, take the flesh of our Lord into us. And you see people in the earliest centuries of the church willing to die for that. Uh.